Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. The most wonderful time of the year is upon us, but let's not pretend the holidays don't get a little chaotic from time to time. Whether you're at a bustling airport, last minute shopping for presents, or are at home, surrounded by your extended family on the big day, sometimes it's nice to disconnect for a little while. And whenever I want to zone out, I pop in my pair of Raycons. Raycon's wireless earbuds, headphones and speakers offer top quality sound and start at just half the price of other premium audio brands on the market. With an almost custom, comfortable fit and a battery life of up to 54 hours, they're the perfect devices for binge listening to YouTube horror content. And they're especially good if you like to relax and fall asleep to your favourite content creator's videos. They come loaded with a range of useful features and settings, meaning you get to listen to your content your way. Personally, I think they'd make the perfect Yuletide gift for the music or podcast lover in your life. Click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade to get 15% off site-wide with the code HOLIDAY. There will also be new pop-up deals every day during Raycon's countdown to Christmas, and I'll try to keep the description box updated with the latest offers. But just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade to get the best deals available on Raycon. Tom Johnson is a riddle. He had a, a smile and a way of talking to you that made you feel very much at ease. Tom Johnson could be someone's co-worker. It could be someone's, you know, acquaintance. And they would have no clue that this other side is there at all until it was too late. The year was 1992. Jeremy Rolfs and his fiancée, Heather Offelman, were both seniors at Middle Tennessee State University. Intelligent, resourceful and well-liked, this pair of 22-year-old lovebirds had bright futures ahead of them, and with their time at university fast coming to an end, they were eager to start their careers, put a down payment on a house, and one day settle down with some kids and all the other trimmings of the American dream. But as we all know, that dream doesn't come cheap. And so, during his final year of studies, tech-savvy Jeremy worked part-time as an editor at a music video company in Nashville. That way, he and Heather would at least have some funds to start their new life with. That September, his boss tasked him with placing an ad in a local publication. The company wanted to sell their Macintosh Quadra 950, a top-end computer at the time that they were hoping to get 30 grand for. On October 7th, Jeremy was contacted by a prospective buyer who had seen his ad. A man who called himself Tom Johnson. Over the phone, Mr Johnson claimed that he was a freelance computer programmer and database consultant, and that he was very interested in purchasing the Quadra 950 and its monitor. The two men met at Jeremy's office to discuss things further. Jeremy would later describe Tom Johnson as being in his late 20s or early 30s. He stood around 5 foot 10 and weighed about 165 pounds. After Johnson had inspected the machine and was given a demonstration, he agreed to pay $31,000 for it. However, he stipulated that he'd need it delivered to his office in Marietta, Georgia, about 230 miles from Nashville. Jeremy agreed to deliver the computer system himself. The two men shook hands and parted ways. On October 24th, at 1.30am, Jeremy got in his car, ready to set off on his long journey to Marietta. He had just spent the last 30 hours working on a different project, so as you can imagine, he was completely exhausted. Worried that he may fall asleep behind the wheel and crash, his fiancée, Heather, decided to join him on his road trip. That way, she'd be able to chat with him, and make sure that he made it to Georgia in one piece. The couple drove through the night, and made it to Marietta at approximately 7.30am. Originally, they had planned to drop the system off directly at Tom Johnson's office, but things had changed. Mr Johnson had called Jeremy, and told him that his office was quite hard to find. It'd be easier, he said, if they just met at a motel instead. After arriving in Marietta, Jeremy and Heather pulled into the Night Sim Motel just off I-75. There, they met Tom Johnson, 
who told them that his business partner was on the way with a check for $31,000, as agreed. Since this partner wasn't going to arrive for another 30 minutes or so, he suggested that Jeremy and Heather get some breakfast across the road. At about 8am, the couple returned to the motel, and Johnson again told them that his associate was still en route, and would arrive very shortly. But in the meantime, he said that they should just load the equipment into the back of his Dodge Dynasty. Jeremy and Heather agreed, but leaving Johnson to be an honest and trustworthy man. He had immediately made them feel at ease, and came off as a friendly and thoughtful guy. However, Jeremy did think it was odd that Johnson's car had Tennessee license plates. Still, he brushed that off as a coincidence. Once the system had been loaded into the car, Jeremy and Heather went to wait for the check in Johnson's motel room. There, the three of them chatted in private about computers and technology. Another 20 minutes came and went, and, tired from the small talk and the long journey, Jeremy started to become frustrated. He told Mr. Johnson that he should just call his business partner so that they could close the deal. With that remark, the affable smile disappeared from Tom Johnson's face. He casually withdrew a pistol from his jacket pocket, aimed it at Jeremy and Heather, and calmly said, I think we can close this deal right now. Jeremy and Heather were caught completely off guard by Johnson's sudden change in personality. His warm and friendly demeanour had, in an instant, given way to his true nature. That of a cold and calculating psychopath. Johnson made Jeremy hand over his money belt, then had Heather lay two bedsheets flat on the floor. He told Jeremy to wrap himself up tightly in one of those sheets, and Heather to do the same in the other. I'm going to take the computer now, he told them in a relaxed and confident tone. Your company will get an insurance check. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Mere seconds later, a loud ringing filled Jeremy's ears, and he noticed the room begin to spin. Everything wasn't going to be fine after all. Tom Johnson had just hit Jeremy in the head with a hammer. He remained conscious, however, and watched as Johnson walked over to Heather and struck her in the head with the blunt tool as well. Heather let out an agonizing wail, prompting Jeremy to call out to her, Stop screaming, and he'll leave! In response, Tom Johnson walked back over to Jeremy and hammered him in the head once again, before bludgeoning Heather several more times. Despite suffering severe head injuries, Jeremy was still alive and conscious. He watched as Tom Johnson methodically cleaned the countertops to remove any fingerprints before casually exiting the room. And as soon as he left, I crawled over to Heather and I told her that I was going to get help and that we were going to be okay. And what I saw haunts me. You know, I can't, I can't get the picture out of my head. I mean, that someone could so hurt such a gentle person. A motel employee would find him wandering the property at 9.30am, clearly disoriented and confused. Seeing that his hair was stained red, this employee quickly called for an ambulance. Sadly, Heather wouldn't survive the ordeal. Jeremy on the other hand made a full recovery, though he would suffer from vertigo and hearing loss for the rest of his life. Luckily, he remembered everything about that terrible morning and was able to give the authorities a full description of Tom Johnson, which they used to create these sketches of the killer. After searching Johnson's motel room, investigators were surprised to find that he had left the hammer at the scene. The red splattered tool was found wrapped in plastic, and still had its SKU number attached to it. Detectives were never able to track where it had been purchased. While questioning the motel staff, however, they did learn something interesting. At some point between 7.30 and 8am, around the time that Jeremy and Heather went to get breakfast, one of the clerks had been approached by a woman who complained that she had heard a lot of noise coming from Tom Johnson's room. Detectives have theorised that that woman was actually Johnson's accomplice, and having learned that her partner in crime was actually planning to slay Jeremy and Heather, attempted to sabotage his scheme and save their lives. 
she then fled the scene. For decades, the authorities held out hope that she would one day come forward with information. She never did. In 1994, there was a huge break in the case, when a potential suspect came onto the police's radar. A 49-year-old man named Tom Steeples, a computer company owner from Nashville, Tennessee, the same city Jeremy and Heather lived in. Tom Steeples bore a strong resemblance to the sketch of Tom Johnson and had just been apprehended for a very similar incident. In April of 94, Steeples had lured a young couple, Rob and Kelly Phillips, into his motel room before bludgeoning them to death and taking $900 from them. In October of 1993, he had also taken the life of his business partner, Ronald Bingham, likely to avoid having to repay a debt. The only thing that didn't line up was that Steeples was much older than Jeremy had estimated Tom Johnson to be. He believed Johnson to be somewhere between 27 and 34 years of age, and Steeples, 49, clearly looked much older. Steeples would pass away behind bars in July of 1994, without ever being officially linked to Jeremy and Heather's case. He intentionally OD'd on a large dose of cocaine, which had been secretly snuck into the prison by his wife, Tilly. Some suspect that she may have been the unidentified female accomplice at the motel. Tilly would later receive six years behind bars for helping her husband end his own existence. As it stands, the identity of the mysterious Tom Johnson remains unclear. The evidence strongly suggests that he and Tom Steeples were the same person, but given the large disparity in age, it's also possible that Steeples simply copied the modus operandi of Johnson, perhaps to confuse the authorities and get them to chase the wrong man. Jeremy would later request to see a photo of Tom Steeples so that he could confirm whether he was indeed Tom Johnson or not. But unfortunately, since Steeples wasn't initially considered a suspect in the case, the authorities refused to provide him with a picture. Sadly, even though Steeples now is considered the main suspect, Jeremy will never be able to look at that photo and make that confirmation. After the incident at the motel, Jeremy was left heartbroken, scarred, and lived in a constant state of fear, believing that the perpetrator would try to hunt him down. He never fully got over the loss of his fiancée, Heather, but would later rediscover his zest for life when he moved to Lesotho, joined the Peace Corps, and put his technical know-how to good use throughout Africa. Tragically, his life came to an end in South Africa on March 31st, 1997. In a cruel twist of fate, he was hit head-on by a driver who had fallen asleep at the wheel. He was 27 years old. It's scary to think that people like Tom Johnson actually live among us, and I don't just mean people who are willing to put a monetary value on human life. I mean those who can so effortlessly put on a mask to hide the darkness within them. Johnson wore his mask so well that, in Jeremy's opinion, his own friends likely had no idea about his true nature. And with people like that in the world, we have to ask ourselves, can we ever truly know who we're dealing with? On the night of April 29th, 1991, former college football star Dick Hansen went on a date with his close friend, known by the media only as Gene with whom he had had an on-again, off-again relationship for quite some time. After finalising a long and messy divorce with his ex-wife, Dick was hopeful that he'd be able to take things to the next level with Jean, who he believed could be his forever goal. In Jean's words, That evening, Dick was in a very good mood. Very good. He was very happy with where he was. He was very happy with what was going on in his life and where he was headed. At approximately 10pm, Dick and Jean met at Original Joe's, a restaurant in downtown San Jose, California. Following dinner, they decided to keep the night going, and went to a bar five miles from the restaurant. They drove there together in Jean's car, with Dick leaving his pickup truck on the street outside Original Joe's. At around 1.45am, the duo departed from the venue, and returned to where Dick had left his pickup truck. 
given the hour. The rest of the street was completely deserted, and Dix was the only vehicle parked along the road. They pulled up behind it, and sat chatting inside Jean's car, just enjoying each other's company. But as they sat there conversing, another car's headlights appeared in Jean's rearview mirror. This car, which appeared to be a 1970 Pontiac GTO Le Mans, pulled up close behind Jean's. Strangely, this vehicle didn't have any front license plate. The driver, a white male in his late 30s or early 40s, who wore large glasses with thick black frames, sat behind the wheel, and just… watched them. Jean wondered if they were blocking the man's access to a nearby mailbox, but Dick assured her that the guy had plenty of room to pull up beside it. The pair continued chatting for a while, but as they did, the man sat parked behind them, continued staring. Slightly creeped out by his behaviour, they both decided to go back to Jean's apartment together. Her place was in Belmont, and since Jean wasn't familiar with the route out of San Jose, Dick told her that he'd lead the way in his pickup, and the pair drove off in separate vehicles. But worryingly, the stranger in the Pontiac also followed close behind them. Well, he pulled out, I pulled out, the guy behind us pulled out, Jean later explained. Moving up to the spotlight, Dick turned left, I turned left, the guy turned left. We go up two more blocks and turned left again, and he did the same thing. Well, by this time, it's making me uncomfortable, so I moved to the middle lane. He moved to the middle lane. So I moved back, and he moved back. This man was definitely following us. As Jean and Dick continued towards Belmont, the stranger mirrored their every manoeuvre. More specifically, he appeared to be shadowing Jean. She tried to outwit her pursuer by changing lanes and accelerating, but she couldn't shake the guy. At one point, she even slammed on her brakes to try and scare him off, but the man's reactions were too quick, and as if predicting her actions, he slammed on his brakes too. This game of cat and mouse went on for more than 10 miles, even when she and Dick moved on to northbound highway 85. Nervous about the unknown man's intentions, Jean pulled up beside Dick's car, and shouted that she wanted to drive to a police station, but he was unable to hear what she was saying. Dick signalled that he was going to exit the highway, and Jean followed him, turning off at the last moment, hoping the guy would miss the exit. She and Dick pulled up along West Fremont Avenue. As Jean sat in her vehicle, she kept her eyes fixed on the rearview mirror. Sure enough, the stranger's headlights came into view. She prayed that this had all been a coincidence, and that the man would drive on by them. But he didn't. He pulled up right behind Jean, just as he had before, and he sat there, watching her. More angry than frightened, Dick stepped out of his pickup truck and stormed over towards the stranger's car, ready to give the guy a piece of his mind. Jean watched as Dick walked up to the driver's side window of the man's car and told the guy to get lost. Almost immediately, the frown on Dick's face morphed into a look of pure fear. He took a step back from the stranger's window. Two loud shots rang out, and Dick fell to the ground. The stranger had just gunned him down. Without so much as a second thought, Jean got out of her car and rushed over to check on her date. As she did, she locked eyes with the stranger. He maintained eye contact with her for several seconds, before speeding off and disappearing into the darkness. Dick had been struck once in the chest and once in the neck. By the time paramedics arrived, he was already gone. To this day, the identity of the elusive stranger remains unknown, and he's yet to face justice for ending Dick's life. Unfortunately, Gene didn't take note of the killer's rear license plate number as he drove off, understandable given the circumstances. The main problem that the authorities faced during their investigation was figuring out the perp's motive. To the best of everyone's knowledge, Dick didn't have any enemies to speak of. It also doesn't seem likely that his ex-wife was involved, 
given that they had children together whom Dick helped to support. Dick's father was a well-known attorney, so it's possible an angry defendant wanted to take revenge out on his family. But it's worth remembering that the stranger had shadowed Jean's car, not Dick's. Law enforcement have theorised that the stranger may have been infuriated by Jean's personalised licence plate. 49er Hugs, a reference to her favourite football team, the San Francisco 49ers. He may have even mistaken Dick as one of their players. Is it possible that the stranger was a loyal fan of a rival team, and, enraged by Jean's number plate, took his allegiance to a fanatical extreme? Or perhaps the opposite is true. Maybe the stranger wasn't angry with Jean, but obsessed with her. Maybe he had been tracking her for longer than she realised, and, seeing her on a date with another man, was consumed by jealousy and decided to remove his love rival from the picture. That would explain why he let Jean, the only eyewitness, live. The final theory is that either Dick or Jean inadvertently ticked off the wrong person during their date, either in the restaurant, or on the road, or at the bar, and that this unhinged individual wanted revenge for some minor infraction. We ultimately don't know what motivated this man to shadow Jean that fateful night, and to so callously mow Dick down in the street. Perhaps we never will know. But the thought that any one of us could, by chance, encounter a stranger, and through no fault of our own, upset them so much that they'd wish us dead, is unsettling. Especially when there are people out there who would take steps to make that wish a reality. Before things end, I'd like to say thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Clayton Thompson, Alex Greensall, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Asia Mina, Azrael Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Dupsi, Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, George Lopez, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, J.B. Funk, Leonardo Martinez, Lyndon Witebski, Monica Mendoza, Peter Logdrach, Philip Wester, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Brad Hammer 33, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Hamish Kay, Jacqueline Guevara Phelan, Shauna Geisler, Peyton Trolling, Itai Allon, Torpid Chair 1139, Nephus 1988, and Lydia Cumo. Thank you so much for your support. The best things happen in the dark.